And so I flew up to Bagram Air Base and went right into the two star and nominated bottom up uh, a plan for our special forces teams to go into an operation called Nam Dong, which was named in honor of Roger Donnellan and ODA 726, the team that I had led as a captain and that this team was gonna lead as well. A mission to basically take the 205th Corps into battle in Aruzgan for the first time. And they, they allowed us to do it. They chopped uh, howitzer cannons to us that we slung load in for the first time since Vietnam. We had uh, a couple of Chinooks and um, uh, dust off and 60s cut to us. We, ha I mean, it was. Uh, uh, we had a, a UAV, which at the time in 05 was unheard of, and it was armed. And so we went in there, and and we went in. I think with like four ODAs and a, a couple of hundred uh, Afghan National Army. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Scott Mann, a longtime Green Beret in the pre and post 9-11 era. 10 years after his army service, Scott gained notoriety for his role leading what is now known as Operation Pineapple Express in August 2021, when he and a large group of dedicated veterans and active duty service members helped evacuate 1,000 Afghans as the Taliban returned to power and what was sure to be brutal retribution for these Afghans supporting US forces for so long. Scott served in the jungle and mountainous terrain of South America and spent years in Afghanistan stand executing a combination of direct action and village stability operations. Like any Green Beret we've interviewed, however, Scott's desire to work with, by, and through local forces shines through. He's gone on to write several books in addition to Operation Pineapple Express, a play called Last Out that Gary Sinise and his foundation are helping to turn into a larger production, and a leadership company called Rooftop Leadership. All of these leverage the experiences Scott had from his time in Special Forces. Now, I hope you enjoy this very real and raw combat story story with someone who never gave up even a decade after hanging up the uniform to help others as much as I did. Scott, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Ryan. It's awesome to be here. So we're just, uh, we're recording just before Christmas here. It's the end of 2022 and I've got Pineapple Express, Operation Pineapple, Pineapple Express displayed behind me. For those who are listening, you can't see it. This is Scott's book. Um, obviously it talks a lot about getting so many Afghans out of Afghanistan. And I was just wondering, as I was preparing for this, I have to imagine this Christmas is slightly quieter than the one last year. And I was wondering what that was like for you. Yeah. You know, you've really got my, my mind kind of going back on that. It, it seems like a lifetime ago, um, when, cause we were only a couple of months into what just seemed like an ongoing nightmare of the abandonment of our Afghan allies. And, you know, we had managed to get some out, but there were, it, at this point in, in, you know, it was winter, the, the bulk of those Afghan commandos and special forces and interpreters and female judges were not able to get home. They, they couldn't go back to their homes because their, their addresses had been compromised by the Taliban. And so they were living on the street. They were running from from house to house. We were scrambling to raise money for safe houses and medical care. I think we had something like 6,000 uh, on our manifest that did not get out when the bomb went off by the ISIS explosion. And the way I looked at it was um, we've got to do something to help those people at least have a fighting chance through what was going to be a horrific winter of exposure to the elements, starvation, and even being hunted. So that's where my mind was. That's where most of us, all the volunteer groups were, was how do we how do we play the long game here? Because as my friend Duke in Moral Compass says, he's like, we were looking at an Uncle Sam size problem with our kids college funds. I mean, that was yeah. basically what we were up against. And and so how do you do that? How do you how do you provide a humanitarian corridor for tens of thousands of at-risk Afghans who had stood at our shoulder without governmental assistance. And that's where we were. And I'll be honest with you, the other thing too, I was not in a good place mentally. Uh, I had had a very dark transition. It did not go well. And I had managed for about 10 years to get beyond that. And, and, it, and it really kind of pulled me back into that place where I wasn't sleeping. I, you know, a lot of this stuff that I had walked away from service with returned, a lot of guilt, and really, my wife and two of my best friends had to intervene. And really, I had to, I was looking at how am I going to 
continue to be useful to this problem set, but not end up in a closet holding a pistol again. Um, and that's where I was, man. I mean, I, I, I'd love to say that it was, you know, in, in a new position of like clarity and all this coming out of pineapple, but I wasn't, I, I was, I was very, very distraught and really just disillusioned in what had happened and didn't see a clear path forward. Uh, and I think a lot of us felt that way. That's it's probably hard for people to see when they've only heard your name and, and seen the body of work. I mean, and we'll talk about a lot of this, but you've got several books, you've got a play slash movie company, like leadership Institute. I mean, it just looks like you got it all together. I think it's just a great reminder that as, as much as we try, um, there can be setbacks along the way. That's a great point. And, and at one point when I was doing my podcast uh, during all of this, between September and Christmas, I was doing my rooftop podcast and it got to where I, I was so um, anxious about what to do. I just, I didn't know how to proceed in so many different ways that I would just walk down my driveway with my earbuds in and I would, that's how I would do my podcast. And I honestly just felt like I was just talking to friends who might help me sort it out as I talked about it. But one of the things I remember saying, Ryan, was that I was so far out over my skis that at some point you're going to have to land. And when you do, it's like that. It's like you're looking down going, man, this is going to suck. Um, and that's what it's kind of felt like ever since the, the Afghanistan collapse. I've just felt like I'm way out over my skis doing work that is well beyond my pay grade and skill set. But um, it doesn't seem that anybody else is coming. And, and so it's just this weird place to be, uh, but you're, but, but certainly, uh, far from having it all together. Um, you know, it, it, I'd say the, the opposite of that is, is trying to, trying to just brace for landing, uh, being that far out over my skis every day. Now you mentioned, you know, your friends and your wife kind of helping you through that a year ago and even still you still feel like you're out in front of your skis but maybe in a slightly better yeah. headspace and environment it when you have that kind of support and you're out in front of your skis does that kind of feel like the place you like to be as long as you got that right support i feel and like looking at your background that's probably where you enjoy being it's a great question man and it's great framing and it's true it is um it was what was different in my transition which, which was really dark and, and kind of isolated. Um, very quickly, my wife and my friends saw that I was kind of moving in a direction that was not just not healthy, you know, with absence of sleep and, and just staying in my phone all the time, like so many of us were. Yeah. And that that intervention was not, hey, you got to stop doing this. It was, Scott, what position do you really need to be playing here where you can stay healthy for the long game and contribute at the highest level? And it was really that I needed to be the storyteller. I needed to be playing at a strategic level. My my task force commander days at 54 years old were over. And I needed to um I needed to take pineapple and divest it to to other groups that were doing the work and and frankly way better. Uh and focus on being a strategic level advocate, a storyteller, focus on telling the story in the book, um, getting on platforms and raising money. And uh and that's what I did. And you're right that once I did that and I made that pivot. Uh, yes, still way out over my skis, but right where I wanted to be and needed to be. Yeah, that's great. And we'll, we'll circle back to to Pineapple sure. for sure in this. If, just for people who are listening and not watching, behind you, you've got a whiteboard with a lot of writing mm -hmm. on it, arrows. Um, yeah. Is that something you could share? Just kind of like, is this how you operate? And if so, what is that behind you? So I'm in my I'm in my rooftop leadership office. Yeah, and this is the whiteboard that's behind me is, is the whiteboard that I went to when I finally decided to get involved uh, with the Afghan evacuation effort and, and try to help passenger number one on the Pineapple Express, an Afghan commando named Nizam, who was a dear friend of mine that I'd known since 2010. And up until that point, had really just focused on helping him kind of on the edges with his visa. But as things started to fall apart, uh, shortly after August 15th, it became very clear to me that he he was going to get killed if 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 we didn't intervene. So I uh, kind of cursing under my breath, I got in my truck and I drove from my house to my little office and opened the door and turned country music on loud with Garth Brooks blaring and 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 drew what was the first course of action sketch I had drawn drawn since probably 2010. <laughs> uh, and that's what that is. That's a course of action sketch that basically we use to move Nizam from his safe house 
to the airfield and then, you know, on to the United States. Have you left it up there as kind of a reminder or just you haven't gotten around to erasing it? I can't erase it. I can't, I can't bring myself to erase it. I, 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 I keep saying that I will, but I just, can't I, I just look at it and, and it just um i don't know why but i can't right now and so i'm just leaving it there yeah that's awesome okay so clearly with with the special forces background what you've done since service like heavy planning operational focus if we rewound back to your childhood would we see a scott who's like that planning a whole bunch of stuff with the kids in the neighborhood at school what what was that scott like different very i think different than that in the sense that i, I was always kind of a peacemaker and we moved around a lot. I was really scrawny. I was a runt. And, and so you, that, that combination of moving around, my dad was a forester. So we lived in these little logging towns and those were hard places to, to make your name, you know? And uh, so I was kind of, I, I got along with people. Okay. But I was really small and uh, frankly bullied a, a good bit um, and spent a lot of time alone playing by myself out in the woods and, 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 hunting and just time in the woods. And, um, you know, it was as social as I could be, but I, again, I struggled, uh, with that to some degree. Um, but I did, I did, I did fashion myself a leader. And as I grew in high school, I, you know, I, I started to lead in, in student council and things like that. And, and I found that, that I did have a proclivity to do that. Um, and I was, you know, honestly, mostly Rex and Anita Mann's son, the son of a firefighter and the son of a school teacher. And, and they both taught me that it really just, you don't need a title to lead. It's just about doing the right thing and, and trying to make an impact and never quitting. So I, that's kind of how I navigated my world. I knew I wanted to get out of that little town of Mount Ida more than anything. And uh, I, I had the opportunity to meet a Green Beret when I was 14 years old at our soda shop. And that really is what set me on a path uh, for something that I never thought I would do until that moment. What was that encounter like, if you still remember it? It was, in, it was incredible. Um, he, you know, it was a Harold soda shop was the name of the, the name of the little place. And we would always go there after school. And um, this guy, I was sitting by myself as, as you know, with all is normal of the case for me. And this guy walks in and uh, I was 14 and he, and he, he, he was in his, um, he was in his dress or his dress uniform, his class A's and, all kinds of medals and ribbons, but he was a young looking guy and he didn't strut. He just kind of sauntered in and I caught a gl glimpse of this soft green hat that he kind of tucked in his waistband when he walked in. And there was just something about the guy. He was so different than everything I'd seen in the movies and everything. Uh, and I just went up and talked to him, to be honest with you. I knew there was something about this guy that I had to, I had to talk to him. So he sat down with me, Ryan, and he, and he, he, you know, that alone, I think just the fact that he sat down with me and talked to me for a few minutes and was telling me about what he was a green beret and what they did and how they worked by with and through indigenous tribes. And they built relationships and they would go into low trust places with just 12 guys. And all that was so, I mean, I was just in a trance as he was talking, like I couldn't, my jaw was on the ground and I knew that as soon as he was done, I was, that's what I was going to do. You know, I, I mean, I was a vapor trail home. I, looked it up in Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, old school Google. And yep. it just, it just, it, it just clicked for me. And, and for the rest of my time in high school, junior high through college, I knew that's what I was going to do. And he actually mentored me all the way through my career up until my retirement. And uh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. He sure did. Yeah. Did, uh, oh, that's interesting. Was that more because you were proactively seeking out that mentorship for him? Or do you I think, think so that was bi-directional? I think it was it was it was me in the beginning because you know I'm 14 and like how many 14 year olds go up to special operators and tell them they want to do what they do. Yeah. Um, but I stayed in touch with him. He brought me up to Fort Bragg. Uh, he was a team leader. He brought me up to Fort Bragg after my senior year graduation. I went up there and him and his my his brother and I went up to see him and we stayed for a week and I got to hang out with his team and they let me do PT with them. And that is awesome. It was insane. That's and, awesome. And you know, I'll, I'll never forget it. And then right before I left, he took me to the old JFK museum and he bought me a green beret and he, he showed me how to shave it and how to shape it. And then he let me, you know, put it on my head one time. And he said, you can't put that on your head again until you've earned it. And so I just carried it for, you know, what, 14 years after that until I could put it on. 
Is yeah. that the uh, beret that you ended up wearing? Yeah. That's cool as hell. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so that wasn't even in the picture, the military, and then you have this chance encounter and all of a sudden you're on a new path. I mean, I always kind of knew I wanted to be in the military. There was, you know, all the, all the typical eighties influences of John Rambo and all of that, you know, and I knew that there was an attraction to that, but it was, yeah, it was really when he sat down with me and he explained the mission of unconventional warfare and, and this working by with and through local people. And maybe it was just the fact that I was a runt, you know, and, and, and this, this idea of standing up for the little guy and helping them fight. Yeah. It was, it was just so attractive to me. I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. You know, it's funny, be interested to get your thoughts on this. After interviewing 100 plus veterans, one of the very strong common denominators is this idea of, of bullies. I don't know if this is everybody's experience because like we hang out with a lot of people who are, for, you know, vets, but man, that comes up a whole lot in their childhood, like being bullied and then not wanting that to happen to someone else. There is something to it. I believe that 110%. And I, I, I even saw it on display in combat. And, you know, yeah. uh, I, I still to this day have a visceral disdain for bullies. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty pervasive uh, in the military with war fighters. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that happens at 14. You don't put that beret on until you're 28. Yeah. So what, when you enter the military, what what branch do you end up going and you know like hey i gotta do everything i can to be set up for success to get into this sf pipeline so i had the plan all figured out right i'm gonna go in the infantry because um uh, i did well in rotc i was a scholarship guy i Where, where'd you go scott sorry university of central arkansas the, okay. the only way people normally know that is that's where scotty pippen went to school <laughs> yeah uh, but it, you know, I, I they had a good ROTC program, went through there, uh, did well, went to schools in the summer like Airborne and Air Assault, made it through those eventually. Um, recycled a couple of times in one of them. But, uh, but you know, did all the right things in ROTC thinking, okay, I'm going to be an infantry officer. Turns out when I was commissioned, uh, it was a lean year for active duty. Um, and I was commissioned quartermaster. And I was devastated. I, I did not, you know, this is not a, this is not a, a lick on quartermasters or logisticians because God knows they are amazing, but it was not what I wanted to do. And it was not what I had, you know, had envisioned for my life. And it was, it was like, it was my first exposure to just that kick in the pants and that kick in the, in the, yeah. in the coin that you get oftentimes when you're pursuing your dream, particularly in the military of being elite. And um, it just devastated me. I started drinking and I didn't drink really, uh, but I started drinking heavily um and started going down a really bad path at a really early age and um and somehow somehow got commissioned as a quartermaster officer went to ranger school this was back when you could go to ranger school as a quartermaster were you branch detailed or no no straight quartermaster straight quartermaster that is amazing fort lee virginia and i spent so much time in ranger school i think i could have pcs there <laughs> i could have pcs to the gulag I don't know how many, I, I'm not kidding you. I think I probably have, I probably still have a standing record. I was there forever, but eventually I made it. I got through, got my tab and uh, went to Panama, spent a couple of years in Panama as a quartermaster, probably the worst quartermaster in the history of that branch. Scott, wait, can you explain what a quartermaster, I've not interviewed sure. one. Um, I know what they are, but for people yeah. out there who, who are like, whoa, what drives you to drink? If, Cause you get this branch. Well, yeah, and I, I got it. That sounds. I hope I know. I'm not coming across as like you know being disparaging to the branch because no, no. It's, a, it's a it's a supply and logistics branch. Yep. Basically, they do all of the logistics for uh, the warfighters. They push supplies, they pull supplies, and they're amazing. Like I I have the utmost respect for them personally now, especially being retired and having seen them in action in combat. Yeah. But at the time, I wanted to be an infantryman, and 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 those two things are 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 pretty far apart. And I had my whole design. I was going to be an infantryman. I was going to go to the 82nd and all this other stuff. And, and I got this quartermaster branch and, and it was, you know, it, it had just changed all my plans. And so rather than dealing with it and coping with it, I just turned to alcohol, um, you know, and, and it set me on a path, honestly, that spiraled down as I continued my path toward becoming a Green Beret. I actually made it, got, got made it through selection the first time and all that, but uh, simultaneously, I was on a path of uh, self-destruction with my drinking. 
that, that manifested pretty heavily in my late 20s. Just a quick word from our sponsor, 10,000, and we'll get right back to this combat story. So this advertiser told me not to read the script, which I loved. They said instead to tell a cool story of me using their gear, which I know you all can appreciate. So I specifically wore the 10,000 long sleeve versatile t-shirt in Alaska. It was minus 20 degrees and we were out snowmobiling and dog sledding and it was awesome. Kept the sweat away from my body, gave me a killer layering capability and also got the approval from my wife, which you all know is not a guarantee. Who made this possible? The best damn training gear out there, 10,000. 10,000 works with the top strength and endurance athletes to co-design, test, and develop their gear so you know it's heavily vetted before they show up at your door. Kit up now and get 15% off your purchase. Go to 10,000.cc and enter Combat Story. That's T-E-N-T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D dot C-C and enter the code Combat Story to get 15% off. They offer free shipping, free returns, and a lifetime guarantee. So get out there, get the highest quality, best fitting, and most comfortable training shorts you've ever worn from 10,000. And now back to this combat story. So you mentioned you go to Panama. Three years, yeah. I, I have to imagine it wasn't what you expected, right? Like when you came out of school, I'm gonna be in the infantry, it's gonna be different. But I would imagine you probably got a different perspective of things having been in this different seat. Was it For not sure. as... Yeah, I would assume there's some value in it as well. Well, totally, because um, what, what happened was I started to learn about um, logistics in a yeah. way that I never thought I would. And even though I wasn't a very good logistician, I, I still learned and I, and, I, and, I, and I had to survive. And so, and, you know, just being in Panama, I'd learned Spanish um, and I ended up getting in a special operation support unit of all things. Yeah. And it was, they did direct support to A teams, special forces A teams that were operating in Central and South America. And I got to see that up close. Exactly. Close. That's awesome. And, yeah. And it really, as I, when I took my detachment command in special forces and then ultimately company command, man, was I glad for that logistical training when I was signing for yeah. all that property. Yeah. I think that's the thing that many people who have those kick in the groin realize yeah. later is that such a good opportunity. And that, and I'm glad you mentioned what you just did about being on a team as a quartermaster supporting the special ops community. Cause that's, they, they have those roles throughout. Like I know 160, it has them. Like it's very yeah. common. You yeah. need that. It's yeah. for the special for ops sure. community. And I would say too, is anyone who's going down your path in the military or really anything, but whatever you get thrown, as long as there's still a pathway to that aim point that you're going to, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. With you. It really doesn't. I mean, there are, you know, uh, who was the kid, the quarterback a couple of years ago that, that won the national title and started out at a junior college uh, and then yeah. went on to Alabama, I think. Was it Alabama or Georgia? No, he went to Georgia. Oh, uh, Stetson yeah. Bennett? Or? I, I no, think that's no, his no. name. I, but, okay. but he started out at a junior college and but had always wanted to be a quarterback at Georgia. And, and man, he got there. But it was, boy, was it the long way around. But he did it. You know? uh, and I just, I, I have a lot of respect for that because I think, I think, now more than ever in the world that we live in, it's it's not it's not A to B to get to C, you know, or A to B to get to you know E. It's like all over the place. Oh, yeah, to get there for sure. I'm sure you see that a lot with rooftop. Yeah. Um, so you get into the teams, and this is just before 9/11. Is that right? Yeah. I graduated in 96 from the Q course and the special forces qualification course. And that's about it. You know, that overall, that's like an 18 month pipeline by the time you go to the infantry advanced course and you do all of your other training and was assigned to a 12 person, a team in seventh special forces group. Uh, I already spoke Spanish because of my time in Panama. So uh, the good news was I was, uh, I was awarded um, uh, seventh group, which is what I wanted. The bad news was I had just gotten married and literally like didn't get language school like most of the other guys were. I was I wasn't even assigned to a team. I was thrown down to a, a a border conflict between Peru and Ecuador, and lived in an outpost for about six months in the jungle. And uh, the, my my introduction to SF in Latin America was quick and real, and and uh, it, it 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 never stopped. I, I even that deployment, I I loved every second of uh, of SF work. It was just the coolest thing on the planet. So I want to dig into that first experience you had and i'm sure you're kind of juxtaposing it right with like i'm newly married so it's not great for me to be gone but if i'm going to be gone this is a great place to be um yeah. seventh group can you share what is the reputation if you came if you're in third group and somebody's like hey seventh group's over there 
what are they going to say about seventh group? Like what's the reputation? Well, every, every SF group is going to talk trash about the other SF group, you know? So the, the, the guys that look at seventh group, um, you know, everything from, you know, the salsa brigade, you know, because of, because of just <laughs> all of the, the partying that goes on there. Yep. And then, you know, more recently we've had some issues with, um, with, with real you know, moral uh, actions uh, where guys were running cocaine and I mean, just some crazy stuff. I think overall though, I mean, I think seventh group, all the SF groups in my assessment are amazing. Like yeah, they're no really, doubt. And, 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 and they all have kind of their own subculture based on the area of, because I don't know if people know that, but SF groups are, a, are, are apportioned geographically. Um, and so, you know, if you go to seventh group, it's Latin America. If you go to 10th group, it's Europe. Um, and, and, you know, prior to 9-11, they were really rigid on that. You know, your language and your cultural orientation were all towards your area of responsibility for your group. And so for, for seventh group, it was all about Central and South America. And in more, more importantly, the drug war uh, that was raging in the 1990s. Yeah. The Andean Ridge. So when you get down there for your first assignment, um, what what was it like? I mean, you're kind of thrown into it and you said you you really enjoyed it. What were some what was some of that mission set that you remember looking back on? Well, I remember I remember getting assigned to this thing called Operation Safe Border. Now, it, now normally what happens is you get you get your green beret, you get you go to language school for like four months, which is awesome because you kind of have time to kind of recover from the Q course and <laughs> you know spend some time with your family, and then you get a team. And then wherever your team is going, you're probably going to do a trip to Peru or or to Colombia. And you get to go down with 12 guys and do this awesome training with like the, the Colombian Fuerzas Especiales or the commandos. Well, me, I got Peru and Ecuador had gotten into a pretty heated conflict on their border in the Sanapa Valley. And so this this SF guy named Colonel Higgins came up with a plan to put an SF dude along with uh, observers from uh, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile uh, with, with local soldados on either side of the border that were actually slinging lead at each other. And you would go in there with like a nine mil, one magazine, and you'd stay in that border outpost for, you know, 14, 20 days at a time, and then you'd rotate out. And it, it, just to keep the peace until they could negotiate a, a settlement. And so that's what I got thrown into, man. And I'd never, I'd never even deployed. And like, and I'm down there as an observer. And these guys, these guys hated each other. I mean, the, the, I mean, they could see they were eyeball to eyeball on the border, and and they would huck grenades at each other. They would take shots at each other, and they would go fist to cuffs. And you know, my Spanish because I didn't go to language school was like a one one. You know, so I mean, it was not conducive to what I was doing. All that said. Um, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever been exposed to. Cause I just thought, my God, here I am a brand new captain and I'm out here on the frontier of Peru and Ecuador, you know, basically standing between two armies that were shooting at each other, trying to keep them apart, doing it in Spanish, bad Spanish. Uh, so it was, it was, it was really amazing. And the NCOs that I was around, I'll, I'll share this real quick. When I got off the plane, uh, landed on a little C-27, it's like a, Fisher Price version of a C-130. It's got two props instead of four. <laughs> and we landed on this little dirt airstrip up on the mountains where the base camp was. And, and the only way in is by air. And so I get in, in I get off the, the, the plane door opens and it's just oppressive heat. And this little NCO is down at the bottom of the ladder. I go down, he takes my, he takes my, he takes my, my D bag, my duffel bag. And he's like, and he's like, I mean, no kidding. He's like five, two, and he's got a boonie hat on that's bigger than he is. You can't even see his eyes and he's, and he's driving a Jeep. They didn't have a Humvee driving a Jeep and he shakes his hand with this big grin and he says, Hey, sir, my name's Dick large. How do you like me so far? <laughs> and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And he goes, Nope, that's my name. And I was like, I'm going to love special horses. No way. Yep. Yeah. Richard large and was iconic in seventh group, but it, it was, and, and I got to do tons of deployments with this guy. We lost him too early to alcoholism, unfortunately. But um, but just that was my like first snapshot. That's so good. That's so that. good. Yeah, it was like something out of a movie. That's great. Oh, geez. Um, on that deployment was your or whatever you would describe it as assignment. It sounds like a deployment to me. 
were you kind of in that, like with your nine mil walking around, trying to just de-escalate, like talking to whoever the commander is, the BC or whatever? Right. Because they would put a Peruvian officer and an Ecuadorian officer in the same hooch, like on this border outpost. And then depending on what side of the border you were on, you had 50 soldados from that country. So like you had the Peruvian and an Ecuadorian officer who were company grade officers and they were fighting against each other two weeks ago maneuvering against wow. each other. They, they know each other and they hate each other. And so several times they would break into fist fights right there, you know, in our little one room compound. And to make it even more sporty, Ryan, they had thrown mines out and our personnel mines with no mapping. They just threw them out everywhere in the Sanapa Valley. And then the rains would come and wash these mines all over the place. So like you're in this little bitty observer compound and dude, you can't walk like five feet outside your compound uh, without a risk of hitting a, a, an anti-personnel mine. So you're, you're stuck in that little building 24 um, seven, man. And for long periods of time and the agitation and the tension you, you would have patrols would, would bumble into the village, you, you know, uh, we had guys step on mines all the time. It was, it was, it was really intense. And, and, um, it was a hell of a thing to get thrown right into, but, um, I look back on it now and it was, it was a game changer for me. Wow. Not to jump ahead too far here, but is there anything that you pulled from that experience that you ended up using on your first deployment post nine 11, when many people had not gone downrange? Yeah. That, well, that, that's a great question. You know, it was just really the local dynamic. It yeah. Was, it was, it was this a deep, deep, deep appreciation for local dynamics of, of living, liter really living in the local area and really experiencing the local conditions and 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 the relationships, you know, because ultimately what, what I was able to do, along with a range of other observers, was we built relationships with these guys and we built trust with them. And they may not have trusted each other, but they trusted me and and they both trusted me. And so I was able to parlay that 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 trust that they had for me eventually into at least measurable trust with each other, you know? Yeah. And, and that was a big lesson for me because I was like, wow, you know, um, even with limited language and I eventually got better at Spanish, but, but even with limited language and, and, and a real ambiguous situation here, um, it comes down to relationships, man. It comes down to connection and, 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 and really being local context is everything. We, 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 we are so far removed from context in this modern world that we live in. And, and um, I, de I developed a healthier appreciation for local context. Yeah. Does this, does Colonel Higgins plan eventually end up leading to results? Yes. He, he, this guy was, uh, he was, he was an icon. Colonel Higgins uh, was one of those guys. And, and I don't think he ever made it past the rank of 06, but you talk about a buy with and through guy. And, and what I loved about what he did was he nominated this, this uh, from the mill group down there. He nominated this mission when it happened in real time and the policymakers and the, the leaders didn't have anything, you know, much like if you look at what general Mulholland or Colonel Mulholland did with fifth group, when uh, we went into Afghanistan, if you look at the, the Ma bell, I don't know if you ever heard about that mission in Panama in 1989, when we invaded Panama, the third of the seventh guys that were living in Panama, um, when the Panamanian defense forces scattered out to their outlying uh, quartels, the NCOs and, and, and majors and captains nominated a plan called Ma Bell, where they would fly in proximity to these quartels, get on a payphone, and in Spanish, talk in their counterparts to surrender. And they were affecting surrender of thousands of Panamanian defense wow. forces, like 12 dudes. And it was called Operation Ma Bell, bottom up. And, you know, I saw this over and over and over again, particularly in Latin America with these NCOs primarily that were just unbelievably strategically relevant and brilliant. And, and, and Higgins, to his credit, put in place a plan that probably kept Peru and Ecuador from going full guns uh, at a time when it very easily could have happened. Super interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. I've not heard somebody talk about that um, exchange before. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit um, to the 9-11 timeframe. And I was just wondering if you could tell people who Cliff uh, Patterson is. Yeah, Cliff was my, Cliff was my ranger buddy. Uh, Cliff was, um, was he, was he at ranger school as long as you were? 
No. No. They, okay. He's the one that got me through. Okay. You know, because I was on my last. They told me they said, "Dude, if you don't make it through this time, because I I couldn't get out of I couldn't get out of Benning. That was my problem. I couldn't get out of Benning. I kept recycling Benning. Um, and I think it was because a lot of the like the basic infantry skills, like I could patrol and do that kind of stuff, but it, a lot of the basic infantry skills that you would have learned as as a PL or whatever, I was deficient in. Um, and uh, we, you know, there was no pre ranger or anything. You just went, and and so, but Cliff was a dyed in the wool infantryman. We were very different. You know, I was a, a country boy from Arkansas, you know, a white kid from the sticks and he was African-American, grew up in the streets, um, really didn't have uh, a lot of family, but we just, we just hit it off. I don't know why um, we, we hit it off. He's actually the inspiration in my play for my character's best friend. Yeah. Um, but, but um, he really got me through all of Ranger school. We, we, he, that guy, it didn't matter how bad things got. It didn't matter how effed up they were, he, he would just, he would always have me laughing. He would, you know, and, and I was at to the point in mountain phase where I was not going to make it. And he really had it not been for him picking me up and, and just getting me laughing. I don't think I, I would have just probably got on the truck. Um, but that's just how he was all the time. And then we stayed in touch um, after we, you know, we graduated and, and went on, we went to the infantry officer advanced course together. Um, we both named our kids, our firstborn Cody. We had always talked about that in Ranger School. I was wondering about that. Kids. Wow. Um, we were, we were, we were thick as thieves, man. He went home with me at Christmas um, when he didn't really have any place to go back to the mountains in North Carolina, if you can imagine that. Uh, and my family loved him, man. Like we, I, and um, God, I miss him every day. You know, Shit. he was a, he was a, he was a really, really great man. And, and I, I just wanted to be like him you know, more than anything else. I just wanted to be like him. And and then 9-11 happens. Yeah, he was working at the uh, the budget office in the Pentagon. And uh, I was at seventh group. And uh, he had, I think he had already been promoted to major. I was a, a, a support company commander, pretty senior captain. And when I we were driving to Fort Pickett to do some training with my first sergeant and uh, my op sergeant, when we heard the, the announcement over the radio that, it, that the first plane had hit the towers and we immediately did a, a B, you know, turned around in the median and went back to brag and watched the rest of it happen. Uh, and it wasn't until I think a day or two after that, that my wife, Monty, um, saw in the army times when they listed the, the, the killed in action, uh, that Cliff was among them. Jeez. And I just, you know, for me, it, 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 it I talk about this uh, a lot in rooftop, but it put me almost in a trance of vengeance. I, I, the second I heard it, I, all I wanted to do was put as many scalps on the barn as I possibly could. That's all I could think about was to get in the fight as quickly as I could and 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 achieve some level of retribution for for Cliff. That's all I wanted. That's all I, and I obsessed over it. Um, and I was a pretty heavy by with and through kind of guy. And I at this at that point, I was just screw it. I just I just want to get over there. And I just want to walk them down. And um, and that's what I ended up doing. You know, eventually got it. It was 04 before my battalion got over there. Um, but I spent the next, I made up for lost time. And uh, I spent a lot of time over there. And I spent the bulk of that time up until 2010 um, walking the enemy down and killing as many of them as I could. And I think a lot of us felt that way. You know, I was an isolated thing with Cliff. A lot of us, whether, but it was super personal for me. It was super, super personal right out of the gate. Is, is that something that really contributed to this kind of state that you you described earlier, the yeah. the darkness? I yeah. have to imagine, like of all the way you just talked about him momentarily, it sounds like yeah. pretty impactful. It was, and 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 again, um, you know, the way that um, it affected his wife and his kids, and the way that um, it just hit me, uh, it put me in, you know, what Ivan Terrell in his book The Human Givens calls a trance state which we're, we all do all the time. We go into positive trances, negative trances. It's basically a, 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 it's a, it's a level of hyper-focus to achieve a goal. And my goals became myopically oriented on payback. And, and so my focus and everything I did was to achieve that. And, and I did that primarily at the opera, tactical and operational yeah. level uh, with, uh, with fires and maneuver and putting, putting teams on bad guys in every imaginable way and, and, and putting, again, numbers on the board. That was how I measured success. Uh, and it wasn't until, and I kept doing that until 2010 uh, when we looked around and realized that there were more Taliban in the rural areas than when we had started. Uh, and that was a real wake up call for me. Um, 
it's probably more like around 2008 when I started to really see that. But we as a community in SF were like, wow, um, this is not good. You know, the, the, the insurgency is stronger in the hinterlands than when we started. Um, and that's when I kind of started to shake it off and started to realize, damn, I've gone down, I've gone down the wrong road here and, and we're going to need to pull this back fast or we're going to get pulled out of here before. And, and this thing's not going to be done. Was that a, we got to change course for you personally, or kind of like, I can't do this for vengeance anymore. There's got to be a different way to do it. Or you're talking more about SF, the big army and the game plan in Afghanistan. There's a saying, Ryan, in storytelling that what's personal is universal. And I really believe that. I believe yeah. that when we look at you know policy lessons or strategic lessons, you can walk it right down to a personal metaphor or a personal experience, lived experience. And for me, it was the, the C-17 ride home uh, after working as a group three where we had killed thousands of Taliban and I'm, I'm riding home and there's a flag draped coffin in that C-17 and I can, you know, all the way home, all I can think about is, you know, we're, we're just putting numbers on the board. Like it's like mowing the grass. Like this is not, this is not going to, uh, and, and this thought of, you know, you have three boys and I do too, of my oldest son uh, fighting a war that I didn't finish. You know, and and that really, really started to hit me hard. Uh, and I also started thinking, you know, I've really moved away from um, what I should be doing as a Green Beret. Like, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. There's a way that you do this, and this ain't it. And so it was kind of, that's, you know, I was very open to um, the fact that I, at a personal level, I had pursued this vengeance thing for too long, and it was it was blinding me. But there was also this nagging, awareness that we were not I was not behaving like the kind of SF guy that I was capable of being and it was when I got back to uh, assigned to Tampa returned I ret got to Bragg went to Tampa to SOCOM that I met a guy named Seth Jones uh, out of Rand who was in 08 09 was talking actively about how we were going the wrong direction in Afghanistan we were trying to do a top-down approach with a liberal democracy and what is mostly a status society of tribes and clans and 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 that the best approach was a bottom-up approach uh, of working by with and through at a village level and man he had my attention and 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 that was the opening salvo and in initial engagements around this thing that became village stability operations and that yeah. changed for me the whole war if you think about your son who i, I think you were saying is in the military now yeah yeah and if he went through something like you did with his ranger buddy who he went to ranger school with passed away in some type of an attack knowing what you know now how would you i don't know mentor him advise him yeah in fact in my own way i guess writing my book game changers going local to defeat violent extremists was my attempt to do that interesting uh, and in my play the things that my character says to his son um so there's two different levels on a professional level I would say that um, it really comes down to building capacity with your partner, you know, no matter whether you're working in Ukraine against a, a, a near state peer uh, or a near peer threat, or whether you're working against a violent extremist group like ISIS-K. The world that we live in today simply does not lend itself to unilateral operations. It's very rare, unless you're in JSOC or something like that you're most likely going to be working with a partner or a surrogate to achieve an effect. And it really comes down to how you build relationships and capacity with those partners and how you work with them. And, 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 and you do that over time at a personal level, I would say to him and I would say to my younger self, um, even though you have to fight and you have to do things that haunt your dreams, it's, it's not about revenge. It's about the people that you love and the people that you protect. And if you lose sight of that, then you set yourself on a path that where it's hard to discern, you know, you from the, from the bad guys uh, at some point. And I think you lose sight on the larger goal of what you're there to do. Instead, it just becomes this vicious cycle of retribution and in, in an insurgency, hell, that's going to last forever. Yeah. Man. So just, just before we leave, the topic of cliff you mentioned i think during mountain phase that if it weren't for him making you laugh like he may have just packed it in 
what kind of stuff would he say to you to keep you going through like no sleep, no food, whatever it is? You would. Oh, man, I, there was one time I had gotten a no go on a patrol. It was like my last one. I mean, like one more and I'm out and I'm just sitting there. I'm so devastated. Uh, it's pouring rain. It, it's 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 late fall in the Tennessee Valley Divide up in the mountains near Dahlonega. It's so it's so damn cold that like it's just what's the point? And I'm just like sitting. I just got my no go. I'm just sitting there and I look up and this dude is doing a strip tease in the middle of the patrol base. <laughs> and I'm like, what? It, it, you know, and everybody's like getting up and clap. And it's like, this is, and I finally, I just start busting out laughing, you know, but he, you know, he, that's what he would do. He would go to that extreme, you know, to, um, to pull me out of myself and not just me. He would do that for yeah. any, he did that for cool. anybody. You know, he was just the most decent human being that um i ever met and uh that's the kind of thing that he would do it wasn't like this big um cerebral or hey hands on hips follow me scott we've got this like it wasn't that he just was so good and decent and human and he and he and he would always go the extra mile to get you get a smile out of you or make you laugh or just let you know it's gonna be all right and then he wasn't gonna leave you and and that for me was everything it's what i it was what i needed you know, at that time. And I'll never, I've never forgotten that. I've never, ever forgotten that. And I've, I hope in some small way, I've, I've been able to do that for others, you know, um, including my kids because, um, and I hope that, you know, and I, I hope that his boys know that because that's the, that's the, that's the kind of man that he was. That's so cool. Okay. Um, if you jump ahead to the first time you're in, it sounds like Oh four, you're in Afghanistan. What yeah. was that first deployment like for you? Maybe the first time you go outside the wire in this new environment, what was going through your head? What role were you in? What was it like? Even if it was yeah. mundane. Yeah. I mean, the first, um, the first time outside the wire, we were doing a leader's recon with a couple of guys from third group. And we ended up sitting down on some guys that were digging in the middle of the road um, and, you know, rolling them up. Like, and I was like, holy shit, like you're not in, uh, you're not in, you're not in Latin America anymore, man. Like it, you know, it was, uh, it was just a different, set of permissions where we were able to to do you know way more and that was the first thing i noticed and then the other thing that i i noticed and i and i wrote about this in my book game changer my sergeant major my op sergeant major and i were driving over to the afghan national army compound of the 205th corps now this was you know on kandahar airfield it's a massive airfield huge i mean they had like a eventually had like a TGI Fridays on this thing. And I mean, it was so big, which is a whole different story. We can that is. Um, but it was a massive base and we were driving over to the Afghan national army compound because they weren't allowed to be on our compound. So that should have been an indicator right there. Um, but driving over there, you had to drive through um, the, the Soviet graveyard. You had to drive through what was the Soviet base on Kandahar. And I remember as we're driving through and it's all these single story, um structures these officer housing and it's like something you would see or you would imagine seeing like outside of area 51 where all the all the people that live there work like this little utopian you know setup um but it was these little single story structures you could envision the manicured yards and the and the driveways even probably with families there there was there was a swimming pool that was filled in with sand uh and then there was this 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 boneyard of all these soviet vehicles that had been blown up, destroyed, all consolidated into this one like cannibalization point. And as I drove through that, man, my sergeant major and I didn't say a word, but we were both thinking the same thing, you know, and it was, we are geographically and functionally not very far from this, you know, and this was 04. And um, I look back on it now. And it was a clear indicator, man, that that we 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 lit, not only did we base right where they based, we followed the same. Oh, path. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. You know, uh, we took the same route to work, man. Like, I mean, we did everything that they did pretty much. Um, and uh, that was that was a real surreal thing for me that never left me. It was like, wow, um, 
we're creating this little utopian version of top-down democracy and and even 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 how we build our partner force we got these guys walking around with oakley sunglasses and m4s and all these optics and isr you know intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance up in the sky but in reality how sustainable is that can they actually can they actually do this unilaterally on their own and the answer of course was no um and but even in 04 man it had all the trappings of you know just a reboot of the soviet occupation to me man that's so true like the fact that we based adjacent to their graveyard basically yeah wow yeah. same in bagram every place that we sat down we we sat down on a former soviet compound you know and and th that alone should have been an indicator because one you're occupying space that is a spiritual clarion call to anyone yeah. who was in the resistance. Like you just occupied the same space that the people that you were a mooj against occupied. And we didn't even think about it. In no way trying to differentiate like no. optically, no. just the optics of we're not just like them. Optics. So we won't go where they are, right. you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Can, uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the ANSF? Um, especially what, what I'd like to do is number one for a green beret in Afghanistan, what was it like working with them? You mentioned some of the closer ones. And then I think we're going to, I have to imagine this is why pineapple becomes so important to you down the road is the connection you form with these guys. So maybe what was it like with them? And then I'm going to ask you about one of the tougher operations you went on with them to talk us through, to give people some context. Sure. Um, the When I got there in 04 with our uh, battalion from 7th Group, we were replacing a battalion from 3rd Group who had several rotations in country at that point. And really from the time 5th Group liberated the country um, with the horse soldiers, and, and that's you know what you saw in the uh, 12 Strong, Special Forces had worked primarily with militia. Right. We had worked with militia forces that were kind of the equivalent to the Northern Alliance, but down in the south and but really countrywide, uh, the militia were still who SF were working with. And then you started to have this flood of conventional forces that were coming into the country from the 10th Mountain Division and, 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 and other in NATO countries. So you are starting to now have this convergence of unconventional remnants. And conventional counterinsurgency that we frankly had not done at this scale since Vietnam. And, and that should have been another indicator right there that we were going down a path. But um, when I got there, I felt like, as did my leadership, it's time to bring the ANA, the Afghan National Army, into the fray. Now, mind you, the Afghan National Army as, a, as an institution did not exist. There was no ANA before U.S. forces were on the ground because the embassy fell in 1978. Then you had, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Soviet occupation, the Civil War, uh, the Taliban. So there had not been a standing Afghan army in years. And, and so we stayed, stood this thing up from, from nothing special. And this is what I try to tell people when they look at what happened in 2021. You know, uh, this army was 19 years old. How many 19-year-olds do you know that are ready to do anything on their own, right? Uh, what's personal is universal. Uh, and, and, and so... Um, but it felt like it, we really needed to partner with them. And seventh group is, is pretty big on, on partnership down in Latin America. In fact, in a semi-permissive environment, it's how you can really, it's the only way you can get anything done. If you want to hit the FARC, if you want to hit the uh, ELN, you, you go after them with surrogates. And, and so we, we really pressed hard on working with the Afghan national army. Now there were not many of them at this time they had only cranked out and it was sf guys in the beginning and then eventually the national guard training these guys as basic trainees but um th there weren't very many of them and the conventional forces and sf was kind of competing for exposure to these guys but um we ultimately started building relationships with them now i want to share something to kind of get to my point about how focused we were on walking the enemy down in 0405 for a range of reasons, special forces had traded off its Title 10 authority to work with partner forces. And, and in that case, what that basically means, Title 10 authority, is the basic is the ability to logistically take care of your partner force. 
right? So if they need fuel, if they need ammunition, you can fill Title 10 funding cash to get them what they need. We gave away Title 10 authority, we being special forces, to the National Guard because we wanted to focus on walking the enemy down and we didn't have time to train or advise Afghan forces. We were doing unilateral targeting against the Taliban. And so the National Guard, when we got there in 04, had stepped into the fray and was actually doing SF advisory work called ETTs, Embedded Tactical Trainers. So if you went out with Afghan National Army soldiers as an SF team, you had to take two National Guard guys with you just to do their logistics. And this is where we were as a regiment in 2004, 2005. We were completely focused on the enemy. And so working with the Afghan National Army was like turning a battleship in the ocean with a canoe paddle. It was a long, slow uh, slog, but it was something that we dove into hard. And it was something that I never really stopped doing from that point on, uh, working with Afghan National Army. Eventually, the commandos and uh, special ops forces came around in 2008. But up until that point, it was it was with the ANA and the ANP, the Afghan National Police, and they were not very proficient. And it was really sporty work working with them in combat. I have to imagine. I mean, but you became pretty close to some of these people, right? Yeah. As a yeah. result, like where, where does that come from then? Uh, well, you know, again, for me personally, it was being raised by SF NCOs and seventh group who, you know, you would go down to Columbia and work in the embassy and the, the four star in Colombian officer, the general of all Colombian forces knows your team sergeant and calls him by his first name because he was a lieutenant when the team sergeant put him through his first close combat course you know what i mean so it was that kind of healthy appreciation for what's possible mm -hmm. and but what we were dealing with ryan was you had the militia that were actually frankly better and they had they had more local uh, awareness and then you had the afghan national army which was ethnically diverse and checked all the right boxes in terms of what we thought was politically correct but they were not from the local area they were they kind of bumbled along they weren't logistically well taken care of so the militia could just run circles around them but yet there was this push to get the militia out of the picture and modernize the Afghan state with this new security apparatus. I was part of that and I regret the hell out of it. I wish I had been more open to a blended approach of Afghan National Army in the urban areas where they could reach and mass where it made sense and then augmented by militias in the outlying areas doing what they were supposed to do, which was defend their communities. We ended up going back to that in 2010. Um, but truth in lending, we missed that in 0405, and I think it hurt us bad. But at that time, was there even a way that you could have influenced that from your position? No, probably not. Not at all. There was such a push from the top, and I mean the top, like at the State Department, at the policy level, to get a, a legitimate yeah. Afghan security apparatus in place that was frankly a mirror image of ourselves. We wanted, we wanted an army that behaved and looked like us because it's what we understood. Uh, and it's where our own, you know, our, our, our own mirror biasing came in. And uh, it, 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 um, there was no stopping that. That was going to happen no matter what. Yeah. So if you think about some of the ops that you went on, whether it was with ANA, commandos, can you take us to one that was particularly difficult, whether from a leadership perspective or potential loss, you know, knowing in advance things could go sideways. Yeah. That helps that helps provide a little bit more of what these commandos meant to you. Yeah. So the the, the one that comes to mind to me, I think it, it, well, there's there's two, but I can I can cover them both quickly. The first one was in no, do, you don't need to cover these quickly for that's what this is about is to, to people yeah. understand what this was like. For yeah. You. So oh five we we were um it was still really, really uh, nascent. The fight in Afghanistan was still really developing. The, the Taliban, you have to understand at that time, remember they had been displaced out of the country along with Al-Qaeda in 02. And they were starting to find their way back into the country. And they had reestablished safe havens, particularly in the central highlands and the eastern part of Afghanistan, both mountainous areas. And so our our charter was to try to root them out of these mountainous areas and really go after them in their safe havens. But we also wanted to get in there with a um, long-term security capability of Afghan partners because the Afghan partners 
like the 205th Brigade in the South, they had never been to war. Like they had never been to combat. They had never done maneuver warfare at even the company level, um, which is a couple hundred dudes. And so, you know, we, we found ourselves trying to push into these hinterlands, but rather than just putting SF teams up there and militia, could we get a flag of the Afghan National Army planted there uh, and start to get a disposition of these forces across the country? And so uh, I was an ops off. I was the ops officer for my battalion at the time in South Afghanistan. And um, what my battalion commander had me lead as a mission commander, um, a mission where we went into a Ruzgan province. And anybody that served in Afghanistan knows that that place is really sporty. And at the time, there was almost nothing up there. There was a base called Cobra that one of one of our teams had gone to. And then there was an infantry battalion that, that was ripping out was leaving and not being replaced. And so I flew up to Bagram Air Base and went right into the two-star and nominated bottom up, Ma Bell style, uh, a plan for our special forces teams to go into an operation called Nam Dong, which was named in honor of Roger Donnellan and ODA 726, the team that I had led as a captain and that this team was gonna lead as well. Um, a mission to basically take the 205th Corps into battle in Aruzgan for the first time and when the dust clears, it would be a covering action for the battalion of U.S. that was ripping out. And it would be a way to plant the flag when the dust settles and have a permanently assigned brigade up, or battalion up there. And they they allowed us to do it. They chopped uh, howitzer cannons to us that we slung load in for the first time since Vietnam. We had uh, a couple of Chinooks and um, uh, dust off and 60s cut to us. We had, I mean, it was uh, uh, we had a, a UAV, which at the time in 05 was unheard of and it was armed. Um, and so we went in there and, and we went in, I think, with like four ODAs and a, a couple of hundred uh, Afghan National Army. We landed on seven HLZs at the same time. And I remember riding in uh, to those H to, to our HLZ with my little battalion staff and, and the battalion commander from the ANA and the 205th Corps commander. And the look on their face and just the sheer terror on their face, I was like, man, we are we are flying into it. And the we landed and the ramps on the choppers had no more opened up and we had gotten into our little makeshift um, headquarters when all hell broke loose in all seven HLZs and the Taliban, what it was, they saw the Afghan national army in these woodland patterned uniforms. They'd never seen that before. And they thought, Oh my God, these idiots are, are actually going to try to come at us. Let's hit them because they knew the Afghan national army was, was new and, but what they didn't count on was the SF guys that were also dressed in woodland pattern uniforms and had every radio imaginable on their back and, you know, two 105s just a couple of clicks away and aircraft that we had stacked to the moon. And so the Taliban actually massed on us and it became a run and gun in battle for like 12 days, man. I mean, it was, um, Whoa. It, was yeah, it was it was like a 12 day. Uh, ongoing engagement all over the province with these, you know, and, and we were doing split ops with our teams uh, as low as two SF guys per, you know, uh, platoon or company of, of ANA. Um, so they were all over the place. And, and it was, um, it was true maneuver warfare, right? It was very ugly, very clunky. We forced the Afghans to use their HF radios. And I mean, it was really, really ugly, but um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the battalion was able to displace out of there. Um, it really, really, uh, we, we did a lot of damage on the, on the Taliban. Um, we lost, we lost a lot of good guys. You know, we lost several Afghan soldiers and uh, we lost um, uh, Sergeant Alan Johnson, um, who was ambushed uh, on a target that I put him on, you know, uh, put his team on that target and, and he, his team got pinned down and he ran in there to try to break them free. And he did, and, and he was killed in the process. And um yeah, man, it was it was uh, it was it was really I think it was a groundbreaking mission in the sense that we really um, broke into the combat advisory role in a meaningful way. And I think it, you know, it, it, it created a, an Afghan footprint up there that lasted all the way through the war. Yeah. Um, but it came at a cost, man. It, it, it was a, it was a real cost. And uh, it showed me. What we were really up against. Um and, and, and that whatever people were saying about these little T Taliban that were out in the outlying areas, it was like, we are way underestimating what these guys are capable of doing, you know? And, and you were the, for, I don't know if it's the right term, ground force commander. You were kind of responsible for this. Yeah, it was a, yeah I was the mission commander. So I had yeah. air, I had air and ground. Um, 
but was forward. And then we had a ground force commander that was an SF guy. And um, yeah, it, it, and, and it was, um, you know, I'll never forget it. It, it was, it was really, it was really um, the, the only time in my life that I ever um, led that kind of maneuver, um, particularly with a partner force and, yeah. and to have that kind of integrated approach. Um, and I, you know, and I'm proud of it. I think, I think the guys were magnificent. You know, they really were, they were magnificent, particularly the SF NCOs who kept those uh, young, you know, 14, 15 year old Afghan soldiers uh, in the fight and would run them down and chase them down when they would break and run. And, um, you know, it really showed to me what our SF NCOs and our teams do uh, on such a, such an amazing level. Um, but yeah, that was the only time I ever, I ever did anything like that. And um, it was, it was a profound yeah. experience. Were, man. were they really 14 or 15? You had people that young. Yeah. The, 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 you know, the, the conscripted soldiers really around the world, you'll find uh, even in central and South America, that's not uncommon to yeah. see, you know, kids 14, 15 years old serving usually in the frontera, you know, out in the, out in the far flung areas, you know, they'll recruit them from indigenous communities or villages. Um, but they do the same thing in Afghanistan. That's what they were doing. That's how they would recruit. Um, these are normally really, really young kids that are that are fighters. Now that that changed as the as the as the the army got a bit more scrutiny and oversight on it. Uh, it got up closer to 17, 18. But in the beginning, they were very young. Damn. Jeez. Okay. So and it sounds like you said some some break and run, but you were pretty impressed with kind of the maybe the courage that they brought to this initial fight or surprised um, maybe i don't know in, in a few cases i was it, it really took everything the sf teams had to get to them keep to it together it, yeah together um and the sf guys had to integrate a lot of operational and tactical fires you know uh to offset that um but you know it, it was enough it was enough to demonstrate or to, to, to push them back and to, and to establish a, a, a battalion flag and ultimately a brigade flag um, in and out of there. But uh, it was years. I mean, really, I personally, I don't think the Afghan National Army as a fighting force ever really developed the level yeah. of proficiency that um, it was reported that they had. You know, um, they were in many ways a paper organization. Their desertion rates and retention rates were terrible. Um, but a lot of that had to do, again, with the way that we we uh, created this force, but also poor leadership on the Afghan side, a lot of nepotism, corruption, uh, and we didn't really hold them to account uh, at the officer level, the senior officer level. The, the, there was a, you know, it was obvious that this kind of nepotism and graft was going on, that a lot of the NCOs were living uh, in squalor and substandard conditions, you know, paying taxes to their commanders. A lot of this stuff went on, and we're, I think as things come out, we're going to see more and more that this was yeah. unfortunately something that we knew about and we just kind of passed it on to the next guy. Mm. So you mentioned the first person who you evac out on Pineapple Express. Was it Nawaz? Did I get the name right? Uh, his, his name is Nizam. Nizam. And that was the second uh, in 2010. I was fortunate enough to help design a program called Village Stability Operations. And think of it as like a modern day Magnificent Seven where we recognized that this top-down approach was no longer working and we needed to get out into the rural villages and help local Afghans stand up on their own because there were quite a few who had village militias and they were willing to fight. And so we, we got back to our roots. We grew our beards out, indigenous clothing, and we even had Afghan special forces teams at this point. We had uh, the, the Afghan Special Operations Command had really evolved since 2008 thanks to people like, you know, General Ed Reeder and others who had really pushed that through. And they were very proficient. And, and so you had a commando strike capability, but you also had these Afghan SF guys who were 15-man detachments that would go in with a U.S. 12-man detachment and live in a village. And they would do the go out and interact with these villagers. They would help them put militias, uh, fighting militias together. Um, and one of them was a young man named Mazam. And when I was helping to lead the initial inset of this mission. Uh, I met Nizam at his graduation. He was one of the first groups to graduate. I spoke at that graduation and then I ended up being down in Kandahar with him uh, on several combat operations and we became friends and, and we stayed friends all the way up until Afghanistan collapsed and he had nobody else to reach out to. So he reached out to me and a couple other guys as kind of a last ditch effort. Jeez. Yeah. So could you take me to maybe that initial reach out 
from him? Is that what sparks your your effort that later becomes Pineapple Express? Yep. I, I think it's probably necessary to caveat that with one thing, which was um, that village program I told you about started in 2010. It was pretty darn successful. We we managed to turn the momentum against the Taliban in a big way uh, to the point that Osama bin Laden, one particular guy named Major Jim Gant, who was on the, the eastern border of Afghanistan working with tribes there for almost two years, uh, to give you an example of how successful this program was, Osama bin Laden wrote to his intelligence chief that they needed to take Gant out and that this, this program of working with locals was the biggest threat to the insurgency. Um, it gained a lot of ground back. It, it really re-empowered local Afghans to not just in the, in the realm of security, but participatory development, governance, tr- dispute resolution. It put the power back in their hands in a way that they understood. And it had not experienced since pre-Soviet times. And they liked it. And even though they had been decimated at a civil society level, you still had enough leaders that this resonated with. And so it was getting some traction. Around 2012, President Karzai didn't like this program at all because it was affecting his influence into some of these tribal areas. And he started to make complaints about it to our president and other leaders. And the program was basically started, it started to get scrapped. And we had made promises to these Afghan villagers. You can imagine the, the conversations that had to happen in those village courtyards when we first went in there, you know, about retribution and, hey, we're with you for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. And we had been given assurances from our senior leaders that if we're going to do this, because I had studied with uh, Dave Phillips and others from CIDG programs, and that was the one thing they kept saying, this cannot be short term. Uh, you cannot, you can't make this thing conventional and you can't make it short term. You've got to be in it for the long haul. And if you are, then they'll, they'll do what you want. By 2012, we were pulling out of those villages and we were setting up on fire bases again. And of course the retribution that came against the Afghans was very swift. My, my phone was called several times by Afghan leaders that I had worked with begging me to help them. And they were killed. And you were uh, out at this time. I was actually just... back home in Bragg, uh, working the village stability kind of education program out of SOCOM, teaching tribal dynamics and then going over to Afghanistan and continuing to work it with General Miller. So I was back and forth, but but um, uh, this was post Miller. It started to really come off the rails. And uh, yeah, I got calls on my personal cell phone from Afghans in duress. And for me, um, that was kind of the end of the line for me. When I when I saw what had happened with Major Gant, how they had basically railroaded him out of the army, when I saw uh, what was happening with our Afghan partners uh, in these villages, um, I decided to hang it up. You know, my dad had always told me, you'll know when it's time. And, and I knew it was, I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. And uh, I'd been selected for battalion commander, but it wasn't an SF battalion. Uh, so I declined that with prejudice and and got out. And, and so I tell you all that because I had left the military, not, not jaded or bitter, but just, I didn't like where it was going. And I certainly didn't like where it was going in Afghanistan. And, you know, that began a transition process that for me, that was not great. Uh, it, it, yeah, I almost took that's a tough way to exit. Yeah. It really was. And, and, and then um, to go through a lot of the, just the being lost from my purpose. And uh, eventually though, found my way back to like you and I talked about before the show, you know, I started to find my feet again and I started to find a way to take my lessons from the battlefield and particularly in the realm of human connection and overcoming distrust to teach to civilian leaders and also a nonprofit that was helping warriors with storytelling. We had our play that we were rolling out. So I was in a pretty good place. I was in a place of, of restoration. I was starting to really find myself. I know it sounds crazy, but as an artist um, and, and there was a lot of healing in that. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you know, I start getting calls from buddies who are, um, SF guys retired and they're like, Scott, are you seeing what's happening out in Helmand province? Are you paying attention to what's happening out in Herat? And I, you know, I say to them, no, because I haven't looked at Afghanistan in a long time, you know? And they're like, it's falling. Like the district by district, it's falling. And then I started getting phone uh, signal messages from Nizam, who had since gotten out of the army, had a lot of trauma, and he was working as a contractor up in the north. And he gave me a play-by-play. He's like, sir, this it's falling every day. You know, this is falling. And, and, and by June... It was clear. He said, this thing's going to flip in a month. And um, and at the time, I just, you know, Ryan, I just didn't want to get involved anymore. I just thought, one, I'm going to get somebody killed, you know, because I, I haven't been involved in this in a very long time. And Nizam, I could tell he wanted help, but I'm like, I, I don't think I can live with another person who dies doing what I asked him to do. You know, I've managed to move on past that. I, I've, I've made peace with it, but I, I don't think I can do another thing like that. 
And um, so I started just trying to help him with his visa and try to get people at Fort Bragg to pay attention at USASOC and some of the headquarters. Because the thing about Nizam, he was um, he was an amazing guy. Like he grew up uh, right at the end of the Soviet occupation. His father was killed by the Soviets. His house was bombed when he was six months old, like two days after his father was killed. The bomb fell right on his house. Everybody ran out of the house. And he, there he was at four months old in the house. They forgot the baby and like everything collapsed on him. Uh, they uncovered the house and there he was without a scratch on him. Um, he ended up joining the army at like 17, he was five foot tall, wasn't old, big enough to even be in the army, but he wore women's high heel shoes to get in. Uh, and like just that kind of guy. And he, he, he was shot through the face uh, down there in Kandahar, where I told you about, we were doing VSO. He was defending a U.S. team, shot three more times in the chest plate by ISIS, went to our Q course, the SF Q course wow. in the States and became an 18 Bravo weapons guy. Like this dude was one of the most respected guys in our regiment. And yet as everything was falling apart, there were no official moves to get him out. He's part of the SF regiment. There were no yeah. official moves to get him out. And it was guys working undercover uh, under, you know, uh, with their phones to do it. And finally he said to me on August 15th or 16th, he said, sir, you know, they're there. I'm in my uncle's house. They're looking around the, the neighborhood right now for me. They're texting me. All of our people are gone. Our generals are gone. You know, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to die alone. And that just, man, that hit me like right between the running lights. And, and it, it, that's when I came into this office right here, um, turned the tunes on and, and started, and I went back to work, you know, in a way that I hadn't done in a long time and started calling people like Congressman Mike Waltz and uh, a guy named Mulla Mike, who was a commander in the first of the 10th over in Germany, but had been Nizam's team leader when he was shot through the face. And we just put a little team together. And we started working our phones and our relationships to try to move him uh, through a very, very nasty city uh, and into an airfield with no visa paperwork or anything. Um, and that was the beginning of, of what we eventually called Operation Pineapple Express. Can you, for people to kind of give them this incentive to go pick up the book, can you kind of talk through what it was like moving somebody in a city? I mean, I think to someone in the States, they hear this, they're like, ah, tell them to go to this place. Yeah. But as you as you describe kind of the private chat groups, how you orchestrate this to give some of the complexity of what you're dealing with. Imagine wherever you're living, if you've ever seen the movie Red Dawn, you know, imagine wherever you're living, all of a sudden you look out and there are, you know, enemy forces rolling into your city, parachuting into your city. Now they didn't parachute, but they rolled in so quickly um, that they're stopping people on the street and beating women for not being covered. Um, they're, they're, the, the, the Afghan National Army and the police leave their vehicles completely abandoned and little kids are jumping on the cruiser of weapons and just firing them into the air. I mean, it was complete chaos. Uh, and this all unfolded in a matter of hours. Everything that you thought you knew about your world that you had experienced for 20 years, for most of these young Afghans, their entire life had been of liberal democracy, freedom, going to school, working a job, and at least in Kabul, where this happened and then all of a sudden it just collapses um and that's what was going on you had taliban checkpoints all over the city and we had given away bagram air base we'd given away kandahar airfield there were no uh airfield pods to lift off of except Kabul international airport and only you know less probably around a thousand nato forces there to secure it and so everybody in the city knew that if you wanted out of the country before the taliban took over and everybody remembered what it was like at least through stories before we went in, you better get to the airfield. And, and that's where everybody went. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people pressing on this little airfield perimeter. And, you know, women were holding their babies up above the, above the tear gas to try to let them breathe. Children were trampled. Um, paramilitary forces were shooting out into the crowd at the Hazaras, popping them in the head. Um, it was complete pandemonium and chaos not uncommon to be out in that crowd for 76 to 96 hours uh, with no food or water, entire families, you know, um, succumbing to the elements, crushed to death, and all of them on the phone trying to call the person that they knew in the United States that might be able to help them while they hold up a certificate of achievement or a graduation certificate or something that might get that guard at the gate to let them in as they're being, you know, crushed and stomped. And that was the environment. And, you know, that was what we were dealing with, not just with Nizam, but with, with everybody else that came together after we got Nizam out, who was dealing with this 
uh, in a similar way. And ultimately what we, you know, the, the name Pineapple Express, that actually came from uh, a code word that Nizam was told to say by the Marines in, at the last minute that he said and, and got him in. And so we called ourselves the Pineapple Express or Task Force Pineapple. But ultimately what that express became was uh, an open sewage canal that you had to jump down into and move through to a, until you arrived at a four foot hole in the fence that was manned by certain members of the 82nd Airborne who we were on the phone with. And you would hold that pineapple up on your phone. They would ask your name, the number in your party. They already had a baseball card from us with that information. And they would pull you through the fence, transport you across the airfield and put you on an airplane. And that, and, and that was, you know, the 96 hour period that we called Operation Pineapple Express. And the stories of the Afghans who went on that express and the, and the veterans who were at their shoulder, um, whatever you think you know about what happened in Afghanistan, you didn't, you haven't seen this story. And, and it's the street level uh, uh, account of what happened uh, to all of these individuals, the ones that made it, the ones that didn't. And uh, it'll, it'll change you after you read it. And I don't want to uh, get any of the 82nd guys in trouble here. So I, I just don't know the answer to this. Were they kind of doing what they thought was right, but maybe not authorized to do? And if, if we can't talk about this, I'll edit this out. And actually to Chris Donahue, to Gen Major General Chris Donahue's credit, um, he was very forthcoming when I wrote this book, he was the only general officer that went on the record with. Wow. Me. Says a lot, huh? Yep. Damn. And, and look, I, 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 I hope I played it down the middle and how I wrote that thing. And there were, there were areas where I was critical of Chris and there were areas where I was complimentary of Chris. I mean, but what I said at the end was what that guy was having to deal with in terms of task saturation. Um, I don't think anybody could have done more than what he did. Uh, now, there were some things where a lot of people in Pineapple are very upset that he didn't let large numbers of Afghan commandos in when we contacted him directly. And, you know, he gave reasons for that, that um, to include task saturation and, and just overwhelm. Um, but but, but the, the point here is that Chris was very, very forthcoming with me on this book. And honestly, the guys, uh, John Folta and, and Jesse Kennedy, his first Captain John Folta, the company commander and, and, and First Sergeant Jesse Kennedy, um, you know, they, we, the way that we reached them, you got to read the book, the way that we found them. Um, but we, you know, they became part of the express and part of that mechanism on the inside of the wire. Um, but what was really cool was afterwards, you know, we maintained a friendship with them. I, I still do. I went up to brag and saw all the guys from the 82nd who had been part of the express. And we connected them to minister Hasina Safi, the minister of women's affairs, who they had helped pull through that four foot hole when state department wow. and no one else would get her out. Um, and they were asking their company commander, Hey, did, did this actually, did we do anything? You know, you know, Cause they had stood on, on guard for all these hours, looking at babies being trampled and fathers begging for them to help their children. They were like, did, did anything good happen? And I was like, John, so much good happened, man. Uh, so I went up there and, and, and we, we met at a bar and we, we shared stories about what happened and, and got them all copies of the books. But, but I have to say, the 82nd Airborne, uh, at least the ones we worked with, they were magnificent. You know, there were no SF teams on the ground, and that's not a slide on the SF teams. Yeah. I think it's a slide on our senior leaders who did not have an SF team on the ground. Uh, one of the Afghan Special Forces NCOs named Bashir in the book, who was inside the airfield for three days trying to link up with his family and willing to help pull people in, he had said to me, Scott, if we had had one SF team, inside the airfield we could have got half the commandos in in one day but we didn't there were no sf teams there and you know i'm not very popular at fort bragg for this but i look yeah you know, i look critically at the sf senior leadership and the use of senior leadership for that and the socom senior leadership because we've nominated these missions like ma bell and all these other things for years how could we not how could we not nominate some kind of disposition where we had at least a couple of sf teams on the ground helping our commandos, our NMRG, our uh, Afghan SF, A, prepare for long-term unconventional warfare and resistance, and B, get through the airfield or some place of safety. Like, we didn't do that. And, and the 82nd filled that gap along with a bunch of veterans, you know, who, who just tried to, to try to do the best they could. But it was a real miss. And I hope it's something that when we look at accountability and lessons learned, that we look at because it's, to me, it's, it's inexcusable. Is there any, 
you know, we started talking about this where you you said you came out of ROTC, you were going to go to the 82nd, right? You're going to be light infantry. Yeah. Anything about this coming full circle where the kind of the end of this is you using your SF skills with these 82nd soldiers on the ground? Yeah, 3, I think thousand miles away. I think, you know, at the end of the day, when I look back on my role in it, uh, it was really a facilitator and a connector. Yeah. The, the, which is what I've always really valued. And yeah, definitely some irony that it was with the 82nd Airborne, you know, um, and not an SF team, you know, right. that, that, that was really, really interesting. And, but if you, when you read the book, you'll see that, that Jesse and John and the guys in that company were red blooded, uh, do what's right Americans. And for the most part, they, they, they knew that security on the airfield was their number one mission and they never compromised that, but they also had been given a commander's intent by general Donahue that gave them the autonomy and latitude to do that kind of work as well. That's great. If they saw that it was doable and their company commander and their first sergeant did that. And there were no numbers of times that they shut it down because the risk levels were getting too high, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it for sure, the way that it all ended up, I mean, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be in the middle of something like that, and certainly leading something like that. Um, and I, I I was constantly, again, this goes back to the being out over my skis. I constantly felt like I was out over my skis and I was blessed to have both SF, SOF, and even civilian leaders who would step in at different times, either when I just needed to go to bed or I just wasn't the right guy to make that decision or to, or to even lead that event. Um, the Operation Pineapple Express, that mechanism actually came from Zach who's a retired school teacher, or not a retired, a retired SF guy, but is a school teacher and his heroes, Harriet Tubman, you know, and, and, and he had this idea for an underground railroad. And, and, you know, um, I was able to have the foresight to just say, you know what, man, go for it. That's awesome. You know, what we're doing is not working as well. Try it. Let's see what happens. And, and that was kind of where leadership was for me was letting the right people step in when it, when it counted and then just trying to keep people connected. So let's, we, we talked Pineapple Express here. This is so, so interesting. I want to make sure we touch on Last Out, right? So this is the, the play you now connected with the Gary Sinise Foundation. What's going on next with this? Well, it's- you or, know, Sorry, what, can you explain what is it for people? We've touched on it. I know yeah. what it is, but for other yeah. people who haven't heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on the nonprofit side, you know, I told you I opened a, a for-profit called Rooftop Leadership, where we teach human connection uh, to business leaders around storytelling, active listening, those interpersonal skills that we used to get into villages and work with village elders, they translate right into the business and leadership. Well, on the nonprofit side, because I had had such a crazy, terrible transition, I had a couple of civilian mentors who showed me the power of storytelling. Um, and as a way to heal yourself, heal your, heal your brain. And also as a way to bridge that civil military gap, I could take the, you know, the lessons that I'd learned in operation Nam Dong or down in Peru. And I could actually tell that story uh, in the right way, with the right structure, with the right delivery. And a, a business leader in New York would locate themselves in that story because we listen autobiographically to the stories of others and we learn in that context. That's the way our brain's designed. So I started studying storytelling, Ryan. I started, I mean, really geeking out on it uh, for several years. And then in the course of my storytelling work, I was taking acting classes as a speaker. And uh, my mentor, Bo, talked me into writing a one-person show about the war. It was a little one-scene thing about a silly band that my son, Braden had given me to wear. And so I told the story from the stage as a silly band and how it, it had been ambushed and how it had senior officers tell you tell, take it off. And my, my owner never did and why and what it was like to go back home with him. And But it really connected with the audience. And they were like, that's a play. You know, you should make that a play. So I just kept working on it. And, you know, six years later, um, it has um, it has toured the country in 2019 to 16 cities. Uh, we've performed with thousands of civilians and veterans with an all veteran cast, uh, 250 PTS interventions in the lobbies. Uh, we travel with our own counselors, uh, 75 gold star families that we've performed it for. COVID shut us down. So we made a film out of it. We raised the money and made a film out of it. And uh, it's on Amazon Prime. It's called Last Out, Elegy of a Green Beret. And then Gary Sinise, during the Afghan collapse, uh, saw the film and contacted me. And we started talking about, you know, if you've ever read his book, Grateful American, which is a great book, 
Um, he has always been a fan of our veterans. And when he was a young actor, him and a guy named John Malkovich were starting a theater in Chicago called Steppenwolf. It was in the basement of like an apartment. And he had a lot of Vietnam veterans in his family. And he saw this play called Tracers. And it was performed and written by Vietnam veterans. And it really moved him. So he brought this play to Chicago, to Steppenwolf. And they performed it there. And they still do to this day. And this was in 1982. And so when I read that, I was in the, in, the, in the act of writing this play and, you know, all the other stuff with my midlife crisis, learning how to act at age 50, you know, quietly going to New York and studying under Carl Bury and Larry Moss. And um, I thought, man, this has been done before. Like, this could be done. And, and I always wanted to meet Gary. I always wanted to get it in front of him. And so when he called me, I was just over the moon. We had retired the play. I had retired from acting, you know, but it was so cool to hear from him. And um I just said to him, I said, Gary, I, I really think that we're on the front end of a mental health tsunami with our post 9-11 veterans based on how we've turned the page on this war and abandoning our allies, the moral injury. I think it's not good. And it reminds me of the Vietnam uh, place that you found yourself in the early 80s. And I think this play is a post 9-11 tracers. And he said, well, what if I produced it for you? What if we kicked it off in Steppenwolf as a, as a kickoff for post 9-11 healing and storytelling? And then we took it on a national tour. And I was like, man, I so wanted to retire. Um, but it was such a, an amazing opportunity that I said yes to it. And so ever since August, we've been in rehearsals and we we did a, a preview in, in Tampa. Um, some of the old cast, new cast members, it's it's all veterans and military family members. It is unbelievable. Awesome. And, and it's basically the story of a Green Beret NCO who's killed in the very first scene. His name is Danny Patton. And he's trying to ascend to the warrior resting place of Valhalla. Um, but he can't, he's holding on to something and he can't let go. So his best friend, Kenny comes down from Valhalla, who was killed in nine 11 in the Pentagon, you know, who we're talking about now. And Kenny brings down other operators with him who are shapeshifters and they become all the people in Danny's life who made his heart pump the most blood, his wife, Lynn, his son, Caden, his arch nemesis, Colonel Smith, uh, Malik, John, the elder, uh, that he worked with, uh, Saeed Wali, the Taliban nemesis, and they, they take him through his life. And so you go on the whole ride from the time he goes to selection, gets married, has his child, nine 11 attacks the Pentagon and then deployment after deployment as this thing starts to kind of come off the rails until he finally figures out what he's holding on to and, and he, and he ascends and he, and he lets go. Um, and it's just a cathartic two hour and 15 minute ride for, you know, veterans and civilians to go on together at a civilian level. So um, we'll be in DC January 6th through 8th, Steppenwolf, January um, 2021, and then national cool. tour. And if you go to lastoutplay.com, you can see all of the tour dates there. They'll be posted real soon. That's great. Well, this has been so much fun. I got two questions to ask you before we wrap, Scott. I ask everybody these, and, and uh, you may have just touched on one of them. So one question is, was there anything that you carried with you into combat that had sentimental value, something that someone gave you that you just wanted to have on you? Yes, I carried uh, my baseball player silly band that my youngest son gave me. I carried a uh, necklace with a cross that my middle son Cooper gave me. And I carried a um, clone trooper in my left pocket that my oldest son Cody gave me because we're both Star Wars geeks. What, was it like a Lego or a old school? It was a, no, it was an action figure action figure that is cool and then last question here is as you look back at at this time from peru all the way through to pineapple express and whatever's coming next losing cliff um you know helping nizam all of the tough times would you go back and do it again 100 percent. i um that's i i i would uh Professor James Clawson from Darden University says that success uh, is when we, um, the definition of success is when we finish something and we can't wait to run back around and get in line and do it again. And um, that's how I feel about my life in SF. That's how I feel about all of it. I wouldn't trade a thing. I mean, despite the chaos and the loss of friends, um, I was able to go to these places around the world that were, you know, most of the people didn't care about um, and, and live in those areas and work in those areas shoulder to shoulder with men and women who taught me how to read people. I mean, really read them, um, how to connect the note below most levels of human consciousness and, um, and how to lead people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do from that place. Um, and that is such a gift to be able to share here at home and with people I care about. Um, and I wouldn't trade anything. That's great. 
people can find all of your uh, your books and efforts in the description here but you also mentioned uh scottman.com right yep, got Scott. that and they can find everything going on scott yep. thanks so much for the time this was a blast man i appreciate yeah, thank it thank you ryan I'm, I'm very grateful man and uh thanks to all your listeners and thanks for what you do i hope you enjoyed that combat story now for a few listener comments. First one's a comment on the Derek Natalini interview. It's a YouTube comment from David C. And it says, thank you, Ryan. To me, the greatest byproduct of podcasting is giving these Delta heroes an outlet to tell their stories. I served in the 80s, US Marine Corps. And you never heard about the exploits of these warriors. 30 to 40 years later, I'm so grateful these guys are willing to tell their stories. They're the best America has to offer, the bravest of the brave. And people have heard me say this time and again, First time I interviewed one of these guys when it was um, Tom Satterley. I mean, it was like interviewing a legend because you just never heard of these guys when you were in the service. It was so hush hush and quiet. So it's been really great to hear what it was like for them. You know, they're real people just like the rest of us, it turns out. But it's great to hear um, what it's like at those elite levels. And the next comment is on the Frank Gus Biggio interview. For those who haven't seen it, and that one is a former marine officer who got out in the 90s and then left his very cushy legal job to go back in fight post 9 11. so really interesting this is a youtube comment from gat mage it says all the badass secret squirrel guys are awesome i love their stories but if i could sit down to coffee for a few hours with anyone from the show it might very well be this guy at this point in my life i'm trying to gain as much usable knowledge wisdom leadership and pragmatic thinking as i can and this fella oozes all of it and <laughs> it's so true i think it would be so easy to sit down with gus and just have a beer he has done a whole lot of things that he can't talk about that we got to touch on after we finished recording that was a lot of fun so I'm with you. If you can get that guy to sit down and talk, you're in for a treat. So thanks for leaving these comments. It means a ton to me um, to see this and that these interviews do have some impact outside of my own life. And uh, we'll keep them coming for you. Hope you continue to enjoy them. Stay safe, y'all.